your Toronto Zoo. My name's Jackie and our mission here at the Toronto Zoo is to connect people, animals, as well as conservation science to fight extinction. Thank you very much for joining us for our junior division uh, general program or virtual Zoo to You programs this morning. We do offer virtual Zoo to You programs that are private as well, but for today it's just going to be a general program geared to towards grades four through six. We're going to be focusing on uh, habitats as well as biodiversity in the Austral Asia Pavilion. Now, when you book a regular Zoo to You program with us or a private one, you actually get to talk with whoever your presenter is back and forth and ask questions, more like a conversation. So it's really quite a special experience for students as well. And you also will receive a pre-visit video of another pavilion, as well as a teacher resource guide. So it's a really great experience. But for today, we're just gonna be going into Australasia. And like I said, we're gonna be focusing on biodiversity. So a lot of people are thinking biodiversity, I might not have heard that term before. It's actually the variety of life. There's three different types of biodiversity. The first is the variety within a species. So we could use humans as an example, which is everybody looks different. Not only is it genetically people are different, they might be immune to certain colds, but sometimes physically they might have different uh, characteristics like different colored hair or different colored eyes. And that is variety within a species of homo sapiens or humans. Then there's also a variety between species or biodiversity within or between species, which is uh, basically diversity between, for example, different birds such as cardinals, blue jays, peacocks, um, penguins. They're all very different and adapted to their individual habitat. Then we also have biodiversity within an ecosystem or habitat. So we'll be looking at all those different types of biodiversity today, as well as habitats and how different animals are adapted in order to, le in order to live in their habitats. So I'm gonna actually switch the camera around now so that you guys can see what I'm going to be seeing. So here we are just outside of Australasian Pavilion. And when we go in first, we're going to be visiting a type of kangaroo. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking kangaroo, awesome, I love kangaroos. Those are those big ones that jump all over the outback. There's actually, 14 species of tree kangaroos, which are our arboreal or tree dwelling. So we're going to go and see one of them, which is our mass tree kangaroo. And I'm just going to lower my voice a little bit. Hopefully you can hear me well. And we just have our keeper here that is setting up the exhibit for Puzzle, um, who is our female mass tree kangaroo. Now, tree kangaroos usually live in the rainforest and they are arboreal, meaning they live up in the trees. So they are specially adapted in order to live in that habitat. So I'm going to show you a quick picture of what one looks like. And you can actually see that they have pouches. So they belong to a larger group of mammals called marsupials that have pouches and have give birth to very undeveloped young. And then they reside in their mother's pouch for several months until they're big enough and the joys would come out. Now, a special adaptation that this tree kangaroo has is a vertical rather than a horizontal pouch. So vertical means up and down, kind of like a zipper. So it's up and down this way so that when they're climbing up the trees, the baby or the joey does not fall out of the pouch. You can also see that they have really super long claws here in order to help them climb up the trees. So no matter what habitat you're talking about, all the animals that live there are adapted in order to acquire four basic needs, which is food, water, shelter, and space. Another adaptation that they have is a really big tail, just hoping that puzzle comes out in a moment, but she might not. Um, and that's what happens sometimes. They're not always visible when you want them to be. But puzzle has a long tail that helps her when she's jumping, as well as super long um, strong back legs. There she comes. Look at her go. Wow. Thank you, Puzzle. Oh, she heard me. <laughs> there you go. I'm just going to zoom in for you. And you'll get a good look at her. There she is. She's using those strong hind legs in order to lift herself. And they can actually jump up to 30 feet in a downward jump from one branch to the next in order to um, climb from one tree to another. And then they also have, like I said, that vertical pouch and those climbing, nice big claws that allow them to climb up the trees with ease because they are herbivores, which means that they eat plant matter. All right, she's hiding in her 
There she goes. She's actually getting some romaine lettuce that you guys can't see that well. I'll see if I can get a better angle. If not, we'll go on into the next habitat, which is our bird aviary around the corner. But her tail is actually the same length, if not longer, than her body. Puzzles? Nope. All right. Well, Puzzles is being shy, and that's okay. We'll see you another time, Puzzles. All right. Let's go into our bird aviary, everybody. Let's see what we can see. So this habitat, I'm going to zoom back out for you guys, is supposed to be representative of what of a woodland forest or a um, dry eucalyptus forest would look like in Australasia. And we have one of our first birds here with us, which is our Victoria crown pigeon. And you can easily identify crown pigeons by the red iris in their eye, as well as that ornate feathers on top of their heads. And they are a ground dwelling species and they are also a herbivore. So they basically spend all their lives on the ground looking for different plant matter, fruits, seeds, um, and they are specially adapted to live in this area. Uh, basically one of the things that they can do is that they are able to fly in small amounts, kind of like a chicken. So although they do have wings, they can only fly for short distances and that's just because uh, relative to their size and undeveloped uh, chest muscles. Another thing that they uh, have is that beak, which allows them to get into smaller areas in order to pick up grains. And they're related to the dodo, believe it or not, because they too were a ground-dwelling pigeon. Let's see if we can spot another type of bird. Hmm. So in any community or habitat, there's going to be animals that interact with each other. And that's what a community is, a group of interacting species within a habitat. And let's just see if we can find one of the kookaburras. They are a carnivore, kind of a hard spot to see them. So that is either Carrie or Jake. Let's just see if we can spot them anywhere else. But kookaburras, you might have heard before because of Australia, they have a laughing, they're looking down at me, checking us out. They have a laugh that reinforces their territory and also, it can be a way to attract mates or to even beg because they're becoming more popular in the suburban areas. And if we look closely, there's another one right up here, right above us. But they are carnivores, so they'll eat things like mice, snakes, lizards, and smaller reptiles. There we go, and you can see that great big beak which they use in order to um, catch their prey and then swallow it whole. So they are adapted to um, obviously live in this habitat and they can fly from area to area in search of food because that is one of their basic needs that they are required to have in order to survive in any habitat. Let's keep on looking and see what we can find. So we have some more Victoria crown pigeons. Oh, sorry guys. But we also have some green wig doves, a tawny frog mouth in here, crested pigeons I saw earlier, and the scarlet chested parrot. Let's see if we can find any of them in here. But like I said, they're all interacting with each other, fighting for those four basic needs, various different food, a water, they don't really have to fight for it here because they get fed regularly, but in the wild they would definitely be interacting within each other, um, within the species, looking for mates, and between each other for those different resources. And things like nesting materials they would also be looking for and, and um, competing against other animals in order to obtain them. So all of the animals that we've actually talked about so far are vertebrates, animals with backbones. But they only make up 3% of all the animals that actually exist in the wild. Most of them are invertebrates, or animals without backbone. They make up 97% of all the animals out there, or organisms. And they're very, very important as food items. So let's go and check some of those invertebrates out. So to date, 1.25 million invertebrates have been classified, but people believe there's actually over 30 million that exist. They're very, very important in any 
community. Let's see if we can find some thorny devils. Now these are quite hard to spot because of their camouflage and that's one of their important traits that they have. There you go, you can check them out there. And they are also a decomposer. So they'll eat rotting wood as well as other plant matter. Might be hard to see, but he's right in the middle of your screen there. And they're excellent camouflagers. Then we have one of my favorites, which are the McKay Spectres. They are amazing mimickers. So that means that they can actually mimic or look like leaves. So those are the animals that are hanging down from the leaves that aren't green, they're brownish. So it's a form of protection for them to look like the dead leaf so they don't get hunted or predated by other animals. And also they have a behavioral mimic that they do, which is swaying gently side to side so that they kind of look like a leaf that is blowing in the wind. Now another thing that allows them to survive up in the trees as they are arboreal as well, is that the males can fly. The females have wings too, but they are not able to fly. And um, they also have a very distinct odor that they can release, the males. Um, and it smells like peanut butter or toffee. And they're all kind of a little bit prickly as well, but they're harmless to the touch. So all of these, like I was saying, are very important food items. We're gonna check out one of the various different types of reptiles that we have in the Australasia Pavilion, which is the fly river turtle, our first one. And it is in an aquatic environment. And as you can see, it's right there. And they are adapted to live in this environment because they have a very uh, flattened shell or carapace, and it's covered in skin, which makes it more streamlined. And you can see he's actually flapping those forelimbs, kind of like flippers, like a, a marine sea turtle with. So they're specially adapted to live in the aquatic habitat most of the time. And they are omnivores, which means they eat both meat as well as um, plant matter. And at the very front, they're also known as a pig nose turtle for obvious reasons if you get to see his nose. And that's because it is adapted so that they can just lift their nose up out of the water. Looks like a snout of a, of a pig so that they don't expose the rest of their body. I'm hoping that we can get a good look without losing any feed here. You want to come around one more time, bud? Let's see. There we go. There's a good look at him, guys. So you can see that pig nose right there. Now, in comparison to the next turtle that we're going to go and visit, you'll be able to see that the flippers or their front limbs look quite different. And that's because they are not just aquatic, they're also terrestrial. So in here, we have our red-bellied short neck turtles. There we go, good morning. Look how those claws are at the front. So they obviously have more well-developed claws, so they spend more time on land than they would in the water versus the pig nose turtle that we just saw. Now in here, we also have a black tree monitor which is arboreal, right up at the top. Let's see if I can zoom in for you. So this is a variety between different species of reptiles. We also have a red-tailed green rat, rat snake, which is arboreal, meaning it lives up in the trees. And a very similar snake, which is our green tree python. Oh yeah. and our emerald tree boa. Now, it's a shame he's not looking at us because sometimes it's really nice to be able to talk about these guys because they have some very interesting traits. So I'm gonna talk about him just for a second. The emerald tree boa is arboreal as well. It lives up in the trees and it's that green color so it can camouflage. It is an ambush predator. It is carnivorous, so that means it's gonna try and hunt things like smaller lizards and snakes and even birds and um, they have a special sense above their lip uh, known as pits and they can sense heat so they use those to actually track their or track their prey and also um, understand if there's larger predators that are coming or around them so they can stand absolutely still and when they give birth like unlike other reptiles all the reptiles that we've seen so so far 
they do not give birth um, or do not lay eggs, leathery eggs that is. Instead, they give birth to live young. So the young ju uh, juveniles, they're brightly colored and that's because they want to mimic uh, vipers that are in the area that are a very similar color, which is a bright red or yellow and that will warn off predators. So they're, they've adapted to live in their environment, although they share a very similar habitat as they do to the pythons, in, but just in a different area of the world, they have similar adaptations and then, then have evolved them even further in order to survive and protect themselves. So another type of reptile that we're gonna see that lives in a different habitat is our central bearded dragon. So you guys might already know these guys because they are very popular in the pet trade. And as you can see, their habitat is more arid. So they're known to be living in like the savannas and the brushlands more than anything um, and plain areas in Australia, uh, in the outback back. And one of the really neat things is that they are covered in these, it looks like bumpy, ridgy thorns or scales and they look like they can really hurt you. So it's a way to warn off predators, things like hawks um, and eagles, whereas they're actually just modified scales that are quite soft and flexible, so they're quite harmless. The reason why it's called a bearded dragon is because underneath their uh, mouth here is their beard, and they can actually inflate that or make it puff out and make it a darker color to show aggression or that they're scared. So it's a, a visual communication um, between itself and other bearded dragons, as well as animals. And you can see an internal ear here that helps to pick up vibrations so they know if there's something that is approaching on uh, land that might be bigger than them that could potentially harm them. Another thing, because it is uh, an area that does not have a lot of water, they obtain most of the water they get from the food that they eat. So they're very reliant on plants as they are um, omnivores. But they also, when it rains, they will tip their face forward and then lick the water off of the front of their snout in order to gather the rain and obtain some extra water. So they're a very cool animal here that we have at the zoo. We're going to go check out the largest lizard in the world next. wonder if you can guess what it is. It's our Komodo dragon, Keelat. So we're really, really lucky because he's right here. I came by earlier this morning and he wasn't. He was kind of hiding in the corner. So you guys are super lucky to be able to visit with him and see him in all his glory. There's Keelat there. And like I said, they are the largest lizard in all of the world and the heaviest too. Now they reside on um, four different islands in Indonesia and they are the top predator. So they're terrestrial, at least when they're adults. But what a lot of people don't know is that when they're young, when they're just little, they're arboreal, meaning they live up in the trees. And that's because their size is so much smaller. They need protection from, believe it or not, the adults, which will eat them. So they spend the first eight months of their life up in the trees in order to protect themselves. And they'll eat things like insects and smaller birds and lizards themselves. And then when they get large enough, about a year of age, they'll come down and they're able to protect themselves on land. So these carnivores eat a wide variety of different prey items, including goats, pigs, let me think, water buffaloes, other lizards, like lots of different um, prey animals. Um, and so they're very well fed. Some of the animals that, uh, or some of the adaptations, I should say, that allow them to survive in their habitat include those great big claws that they use to protect themselves and also to fight with and get food. Um, and then also their great big tail, which you can't really see here, but it is very large, so large that they can actually use it to knock over prey items, as well as their teeth. So in their teeth, they're actually serrated, which means that they're jagged at the edges and they can cut through flesh with ease. So it's a great way for them to eat and obtain meat and they have a special saliva that contains a lot of bacteria as well as venom in it, so his bite is actually deadly. So you wouldn't want to see a Komodo dragon up close other than behind glass here. A really neat other thing that uh, adaptation that they have is that they eat a lot of carrion, which is dead animals or dead ma uh, animal matter, 
And so they have a very keen sense of smell and they use their Jacobson organ, which is inside of the top of the roof of their mouth, as well as their tongue in order to taste the air. So what they'll do is flick out their forked tongue and see which side of the chemical of their forked tongue that uh, the chemicals are for whatever that they are hunting or tracking. And then they'll put it up inside of their Jack Jack Jacobson's organ and then be able to say, okay, it's on the left or the right hand side before moving forward. And they can track up to 10 kilometers away. So they're very, very good and well adapted in order to find food. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and check out one more animal here before we go into our Great Barrier Reef area. And I'm hoping he's still there because you don't get to see him all the time. It's one of our wombats. Let me just see if he's still here. Oh, there he is. So I was talking about how marsupials have pouches um, that the females will have in order to protect their young. And we're very lucky because wombats, you don't get to see them too often, um, but they normally are very big burrowers. So they spend a lot of the time underground. Um, and that's why we have that great big tube there for them. But one of the special adaptations that they have in order to survive in their habitat is that their pouch is a different direction than that of what we saw before on the tree kangaroo. It actually faces backwards. I can't believe he's so close. You guys are super lucky. So our female is named Matilda, and I'm not sure who this is, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see. There we go. But their pouch actually faces backwards, and that's because the opening, they want to go towards their bum so that when they're digging, they don't put di uh, dirt inside of their pouch. So it's kind of like backwards, but it works for them and protects their young. There we go, what a cutie. Hey bud. All right guys, we're gonna go and check out some more animals. Over on the other side, I'll wave goodbye. Oh, look it, found another. There we go. So we're gonna be going into our Great Barrier Reef exhibit. And the first animal that we're gonna see is a type of amphibian. And amphibians are animals that have naked or bare skin that are moist and lay jelly-like eggs normally. So this is our Solomon Island leaf frog and they inhabit usually leaf litter in the rain. So there's one right there. And it's really dark in here because they're actually nocturnal, meaning they're only active at night. And it's kind of hard to see, but this guy right here has all those kind of projections all over it and have ridges above the eye, and that's so that it looks like a leaf. So it's mimicking leaves as well, so that it can blend in, and it has protection from predators, and also it's able to ambush any prey item, any food that it wants to eat. So frogs in general are very important in any community because they monitor the population of insects, as well as they provide a lot of food for any predators. So they're very, very important. Let's see. And one really neat adaptation that these guys have is that they actually do not metamorphose from a tadpole into a frog. They have a direct life cycle where they lay eggs and then go into tiny uh, frog lits straight away. And that's because there isn't very much water in their, in their area where there's freestanding water. So they have developed over time just to change from a tiny egg into tiny froglets. Pretty cool adaptation for their habitat in order to survive, if you ask me. All right, guys, we're gonna check out some more invertebrates. And the first one that we're gonna see is actually a coral. So corals are a very unique animal in that they're not just an animal, they're also a plant as well as a mineral. And this is a really great shot because you can see the animal part here, but inside of him, I'm just gonna to refer to it as a him, but inside of the coral, there's a plant and it has a special uh, symbiotic relationship, that means like a special relationship, and it's mutualistic, meaning it's beneficial for both the algae, the zooxanthellae, which is the algae, as well as the organism or the coral, because the algae gets protection as the coral has stinging cells called nematocysts that protect it from predators, 
and then in return, the coral gets food from the plant. It gets um, simple sugars because the algae is able to photosynthesize. Then underneath it, it is all based upon this mineral or calcareous base. And what happens is new corals are formed on top of old corals, and then it eventually forms a great big reef. So that's how coral reefs are formed, from old polyps growing on, or sorry, new polyps growing on top of old polyps. And this type of ecosystem in the ocean, the Great Barrier Reef, is very, very important. It's known as a biodiversity hotspot, and that's because of all of the variety of different fish and invertebrates that actually live there or spawn and have young or offspring that live inside of it. And that provides not only food um, and shelter, but also space for them to grow up and grow larger. So some of the different animals that we're talking about that might occupy the habitat of an ocean uh, reef include seahorses, as well as jellyfish that you might have seen before at the zoo. We'll come over here, and there's tons of different invertebrates um, in the aquatic area. You just don't pay as much attention to them usually because they are so much smaller. But these are invertebrates that feed on smaller, tinier invertebrates. And then we also have all of the fish that call it home. So, and these are just a few of the different species that might occupy tropical waters. My favorite is the clown trigger fish. I wonder if you guys can guess which one is the clown trigger. Let me see if I can include him in the shot for you. He's actually down at the bottom of your screen. He's got a nice big pair of yellow lips and all those black on his face and white spots just here. That's a clown trigger, one of my favorites. All right, guys, we're going to head over to the polar bears next, believe it or not. And that is just because I want to compare uh, one top predator from a region to another one. So while we're heading over to the polar bear area in the tundra, I'm just going to switch the camera around for one second if I can. There we go. Hey guys again. And I just wanted to touch base with you about some of our programs that we do offer. So um, our zoo to you program is similar to the one that you just had, but it also focuses on, there's a couple of different ones actually, uh, it focuses on various different grades that are all cur curriculum um, linked. So for grade five, we have like digestion, grade four is habitats, grade six is biodiversity, and we have them for the primary level as well. Um, and you also get to have a pre-video of a different area of the zoo that you visit. So it's kind of preps the students for your visit and live one. And then it also allows you to have the opportunity to chat with your instructor at the zoo. So you can prep questions with the kids ahead of time, um, or you can just let them ask any questions that they might have about a particular animal that they're really interested in. So it's a great way for them to build confidence and gain uh, information relative to what their interests are. So it's a really great experience. Then we also have our meet and greets, which are only a few minutes. Uh, they're about 15 minutes in length, but if there's a favorite animal, then you can maybe pick it for your class or find out what questions you would like to have about them and um, ask away. And then we also have lots of other free programs here at the zoo, such as our Aqualinks or our Blue Schools program. So I encourage you to go online at our website, torontozoo.com, in order to find out more about our different resources that we have available for you that are free, um, as well as some of our different programs. So we're here at the tundra. I'm gonna switch your camera back around here. Maybe. <laughs> there we go, guys. So when we're talking about the tundra area or habitat, it is very cold there. And as you can imagine, there's not a lot of trees. Actually, there's no trees. There's low lying like plants and, and tundra and um, lichen, but mostly it's rocky and it's icy and has very cold extremes. So we have five polar bears that reside here at the Toronto Zoo. The two sisters, which are 20 years in age. Then we also have our two boys, Hudson and Humphrey, who are nine and seven. And then our little girl, 
who is five, Juno. I'm just gonna see who's out. Hopefully somebody's out. Oh, I walked right by them. I can see them through the maternity glass here. Perfect. So these animals are very well adapted to live somewhere where it's cold because of several different adaptations. So I told you before, they're always adapted to live in their habitat. Here we go. So polar bears in general have to be built to withstand the cold. So I'll tell you a couple of neat facts about these guys. So one of the things that they have is enormous paws. And you think, how does that help them? Well, it helps them to stay up on top of the snow so they don't sink. They work kind of like snowshoes. So they spread out and, and evenly distribute their weight so they don't sink in so that they can travel further distances. They also have a lot of blubber or fat. And that's because it's a very good insulator so that when they're swimming or when they're even just walking, they don't get cold. The guard hair on them is the first layer of hair that protects them and it's also kind of waterproofed. And then they also have a second layer underneath that for warmth. There we go. Zoom out, it's kind of nice that he's quite this close. So there is, they have two layers of fur that helps to keep them warm. And then you'll see that their ears and their tail are very small and close to their body and that helps to retain heat as well. Now, if you know a lot about polar bears, they are specialized eaters. The number one thing that they eat in the wild is actually ringed seals. So they're very specialized. If something was to happen to their diet, it would not be a very good outcome for these bears. Whereas something like a top predator, such as the Komodo dragon, who eats a lot of different um, species, um, because it has a lot of choice, because there's a lot of biodiversity within their habitat, they're able to survive. So often when there's an animal that is specialized, any changes in the environment have a greater effect than that what it would be in something that does not have a specialized area. I'm just gonna get a nice close up. I've never been this close here. There must be something very interesting on the ground. Awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. Whoa, what are you smelling? I guess I should talk about their smell. They also have a very keen sense of smell um, that they can actually track food up to, I'm not sure how many miles away, but it's like four soccer fields um, that they can sniff a uh, seal from and then up to a meter in depth under the snow so they can actually find them. Because these guys rely on the ice in order to um, hunt their prey. And without the ice, they're in a lot of trouble. All right, guys, he's starting to mist up the window. So I'm going to switch things around here, guys. And I did just want to say thank you very much for joining us today, guys. That's the end of our junior tour. If you have any questions, please email us at programs at torontozoo.com. You can also become one of our uh, e-newsletter subscribers in order to find out any new information about our programs here at the zoo, as well as our resources for educators. And um, I hope you guys stay safe and stay healthy. Take care, guys. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us.